for AMP Capital as a large investment manager, we manage uh, approximately $130 billion of assets under management. We invest broadly across all asset classes and we have a range of investment styles uh, across um, the various uh, asset classes that we invest. So what's important is to understand how ESG issues will ultimately affect our investment decision making. And so our approach to ESG integration needs to have a lot of inbuilt flexibility about the way we approach that. Um, our, our portfolios need to deal with um, a fair amount of complexity. We need to uh, manage the fact that we have a range of different investment styles, often within the same asset class. And we also need to make sure that we um, recognise that there are different levels to, I guess, our level of ownership and our ability to engage with the companies and assets in which we invest. Our ultimate aim, though, is to see that ESG issues are, are considered in the same balanced way as we would any other material risks that could impact um, the investment. So when we sort of then look at our different investment styles, um, in our quant funds, it's really about understanding how ESG issues can impact a particular company within the portfolio. And for our fundamental equities teams, it's really about understanding um, our portfolio managers getting a, a deeper level of insight and understanding what issues are material, um, particularly over the time frames in which um, they're typically investing. But at the core of this process is about making sure that we have the right kind of uh, information and guidance being provided to those portfolio managers and investment teams. And the way we do that is by having a dedicated in-house ESG research team um, that sits within these investment teams and provides all the guidance and analysis that's required to, uh, to inform those views for the portfolio managers. And, and I think the other important thing here is to make sure that there's very clear signals coming from the executive management of the business around what the organisation's core philosophy uh, is around ESG integration. So it's very important that we have our investment committee um, that's very much providing clear guidance to our teams as to what their expectations are in relation to integrating ESG within our portfolios. So in terms of the investment process, there's a number of steps that we might typically go through um, to get a deeper understanding of how material or otherwise the particular ESG issues um, might be. So the first thing you want to do is basically identify um, what issues are potentially material. And so an analyst might typically ask themselves the question as to what particular issues are important for a particular company to protect and grow value. And then how, how that's actually reflected can actually vary from sector to sector, from company to company, or it could be highly dependent, for example, on a particular business model. The next step is to identify what we believe are the core strategic risks that might potentially impact that sector or that company. And this could be effectively uh, looking at the external environment within which that company operates. It might relate to macro issues such as the introduction of new regulation, um, issues such as climate change, occupational health and safety, um, labour issues, for example, um, that a company might be exposed to through, for example, uh, their supply chain uh, in Asia. Um, the next step is to really look at the company's business strategy. What is this business trying to actually achieve over a particular time frame? What have they told the market about their forward business strategy? And what we're trying to do there is to determine what are the key drivers that the business sees are crucial elements in terms of delivering and protecting and growing value. And we would then might typically look to see how, for example, that might be reflected in the culture of the organisation. So if you have a business um, where innovation is crucial to the execution um, of their business strategy, then you would typically want to understand to what extent is a culture of innovation uh, fostered within the organisation. Once we've gone through these processes of identifying key strategic risks, understanding business strategy, we're then in a position where we can then evaluate, well, how robust is the company's risk management framework around dealing with those key strategic issues? And clearly we're talking here about what governance processes does the organisation have in place? 
what policies and procedures are there? What are the reporting systems and monitoring around risks? How is this fed back to executive management? How does it influence and how does it link back to uh, business strategy? Sure. So if we're, if we're looking at financial impacts, normally what you might typically look at uh, what are the risks around earnings and growth forecasts for a particular company um, or their business strategy and, um, and, and how does that affect our overall consensus view on a particular company. So going back to what I was saying before, if, you're, if, a, if the core uh, elements of business strategy, say for example in the telecommunications industry, is to grow market share in a particular uh, location. Um, one of the things that we might typically look at is, well, what are the levels of customer complaints um, for the particular company? And in one example, we found um, a company was trying to uh, aggressively grow its market share, but we also saw the customer complaints um, for the company were increasing significantly. And so this allows us to bring um, the analysis of a deeper insight into core risks that affect the ability of the business to realise its strategy and we can actually then bring that back in and start applying that in things like uh, discounted cash flows or, or, or reflecting that in our overall consensus view or conviction on a particular stock. So that can also be translated into say an ESG score that might typically be then plugged into our, our quantitative models. In, in Australia over the last 12 to 18 months there's been a very uh, significant debate around the introduction of carbon regulation or carbon pricing uh, in the Australian marketplace. And uh, with, with regulation now commencing in July of 2012, um, previously there's been a lot of uncertainty about the level of carbon pricing and carbon risk and how that affects uh, particular companies uh, in certain sectors. And so in a fixed income context, um, we have held debt instruments in the power sector for a number of years. And prior to the introduction of the regulatory uh, framework, there was a lot of uncertainty about the impact of carbon pricing on particular assets, uh, particularly coal-fired assets, um, gas-fired generation assets. So what our ESG research team did in this occasion is to basically review the nature of the regulatory framework, um, the sensitivities of particular generation assets to, to the carbon price itself, what other features of the regulatory framework were important in terms of things like the allocation of free permits or other transitional assistance that may be provided to the company. And I think the significance about this particular example is that you now have uh, much greater certainty over an issue in which previously there was a lot of uncertainty to an extent. And, and we found in this case that um, the impact of the carbon price um, was actually not going to have a significant impact. In fact, it was actually going to benefit the company in the short term because they were going to benefit from not only the transitional assistance, but they would also benefit from uh, overall increases in the wholesale price of electricity. So it's really important to, to look at these issues in a holistic way um, and, 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 and what it ultimately leads to is a, is, is a strengthening of the conviction around our decision to retain uh, our investment in this particular uh,